I'd like to begin uh, this, this Q&A period by first anchoring our conversation in a clear understanding of the facts, many of which were laid out by Dr. Osili in her prepared uh, remarks and, um, and also in, in uh, her testimony here today. So, um, Dr. Osili, in summary fashion, I, I'm going to ask you a few different questions here. Maybe you could give me a minute uh, response uh, on each of them, if possible. First, can you briefly discuss the magnitude of private philanthropy uh, and of all private financial flows uh, to developing countries as compared to official development assistance? I know Mr. Rundy touched on this as well. Thank you, Chairman. Very quickly, the U.S. total engagement with the developing world is estimated at $365 billion. $33 billion, so 9% roughly, is official development assistance. And the rest of that 91% consists of private sector involvement, including private capital flows, remittances, and private philanthropy. Private philanthropy is estimated at about $44.5 billion, with the largest of that coming from U.S. NGOs. And, and uh, second, uh, I would say the second largest would be U.S. corporations, and then foundations at $4.5 billion. That's the total engagement with the developing world. Because we're also talking about American households, I'll just give some anchoring statistics there. About under 10% of U.S. households give to international organizations. The average contribution on an annual basis is about $100. That's from our philanthropy panel study. In international disasters, we see a much larger response. As an example, about a third of U.S. households gave to the Asian tsunami in 2004, and the average contributions there were about $100 on average. <coughs> How, is it, how does the United States compare to other OECD countries with respect to uh, using a broader measure of development assistance as examined in the index of global philanthropy and remittances? Excellent question. As we can, as all of us perhaps know, when we look at overall official development assistance, just in share numbers, the U.S. leads, but as a share of our GDP, we are ranked much lower, one out of eight, 18th in the sample that is studied in the index. When the broader measure of total engagement is used, the U.S. moves from 18th to 8th. So we become one of the top uh, engagers as a fraction of our GDP in terms of our total engagement. And in dollars, we're still at the very top. Uh, this broader measure of total engagement also improves the rankings of several other countries, not just the US. Uh, Germany certainly improves the United Kingdom and many other countries. So the measure of total engagement gives us a much more complete and comprehensive view of all of the ways that the US, both individual corporations, foundations, our private sector, as well as our government, are engaging with the developing world. What are the trends over time in private philanthropy for our international development uh, assistance? Excellent question as well, Mr. Chairman. We have seen private philanthropy grow during this period. As an example, between 2000 and 2014, private growth, private sector contributions increased by about 88%. In the same context, official development assistance increased by about 50%. So we're seeing uh, private sector flows increasing much faster than official development assistance in the same time period. To anchor it again, looking at U.S. households, in 2000, we had about 1% of American households giving to international organizations. Today, that's closer to 10% of U.S. households, one out of every 10 and contributing to international uh, affairs organizations. So much more engagement in terms of international philanthropy, both with U.S. households, corporations, foundations, the private sector, as well as, as we can see, the community as a whole. Okay, thank you. I, Mr. Rundy, uh, do you have anything to add to uh, the uh, numbers that were just laid out and some of the trend lines we've seen? Just that I, I do think it's important for us to understand the totality of our engagement. It's very important. Um, I do think, though, that uh, I want to just emphasize that other financing is not going to is not going to replace uh, the role of the U.S. government. Um, and I would also add that 
uh, international development, countries that have developed have developed because of good governance and because of a growing formal private sector. So there, these are very important in terms of keeping, it, these are very important flows, but ultimately the, it's, it's, a, it's a function of good governance and a growing formal private sector. If you look at South Korea, if you look at China, if you look at Costa Rica, you look at Chile, you look at Poland, these are all countries that it was, though, it was good policies and, 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 and formal private sector. I would also say the following, that, the, that these, these really important forces, and I have built many partnerships, um, uh, are not going to be able to fill the gap on things like elections monitoring or democracy promotion. I know that something that you care a lot about is the issue of how we're going to deal with famines. Famines don't happen in dictatorships. Well, if we want to have multi-party democracies, that requires the, in, the, net, the National Endowment of Democracy institutions like the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute. Well, there's not necessarily private, they have a very hard time, those institutions, raising money from private philanthropy and certainly not corporate philanthropy. There's no money for that. Um, if we want to work, in, if, if the world is going the way I've described it as, and I submitted for the record a, a report looking at how the developing world is going, I call it a tale of two paths. We have countries going towards wealth, towards development, and we have uh, countries that are failed and failing states. Uh, I would argue that it's, uh, we're going to have to be, we're going to have to put a lot more of our official aid in these failed and failing states. So um, it's, uh, I think it's, these are very important numbers. I, I would also argue, though, that um, I think luckily the international conversation is moving away from should we be spending 0.7% of our official development assistance, but they are interested in what kind of impact we're making and how effective we are. And so I think that's a, that's a good thing. So I do think this, this broader picture is helpful for that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rundy. Uh, for those who, uh, those tens of people who just tuned into uh, C-SPAN 2 um, to watch this subcommittee hearing, um, I, I do think it's important uh, for me to emphasize as well uh, something I said in, in my opening remarks, which is that um, official government assistance is going to continue to play an important role. I would add uh, our, our contributions to multilateral institutions will continue to play an important role. We need to optimize uh, those programs. I think uh, to the extent we can, we can leverage philanthropy, remittances, uh, and uh, even foreign direct investment in creative ways, uh, we, we, we can um, help affect change in, in those areas leading to better outcomes to our diplomacy and development. Dr. Osley, moving on, uh, U.S. private philanthropy to international causes, uh, you indicated has grown over time. That leads to a natural question, why? Great question once yeah. again, Mr. Chairman. This is something that our research has focused a lot on, understanding the whys. There are several reasons for this increasing trend. The first is the improvement in technology and communication, allowing donors in every part of the country in the U.S. today to send a donation to support a cause or even to engage in an issue they care about wherever it is, whether that's in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Europe, et cetera. So our improvement in technology has allowed us to reach uh, the far-flung corners of the globe. I think that's one. The second factor that is important is that we live increasingly global lives. People travel, they're exposed to individuals throughout the world. Many of our global companies are working in communities around the world. This also creates an environment where there is an interest in causes around the world. And third, I don't think we can rule out the role that some of our leaders have played in raising awareness around these global issues with Bill and Melinda Gates at the forefront of many health and education issues globally as well as Warren Buffett um, I would even add Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan have really raised awareness around the need to invest but also to uh, help improve lives in our backyard but also in communities around the world so I think we have several factors that have aligned to create this interest in global philanthropy. And of course, uh, many of uh, the products we consume today come from many, the music we listen to, our, our lives are informed by a much more global culture than ever before. 